be a student uh, of uh, whatever you're trying to achieve and and keep learning and take action at the same time right and you don't get to see everything you know very clearly from the first uh, it's possible that you may not see everything clearly uh, but you can take some action and go a little further and see a little bit more and take further action and keep doing that and you will you will, uh, you know, uh, overall succeed. As an operator, I know other investors are romanticizing multifamily investing, and I'm looking to learn from other investors' mistakes. I know you are too, and you found the right place. Welcome to Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. Hey, everybody, and welcome to Myers Methods Presents Multifamily Missteps. I'm your host, Jerome, and you guys are an extremely special treat today. I've got my friend from New York who invests in North Carolina, Fancham Gupta. Fancham, how are things in the great state of New York? Things are great here. Weather is warming up, so I can't complain. It's, it's amazing, actually, out there uh, right now. Great time to be here. But I love your part of the world even more because I'm traveling there tomorrow so <laughs> come on love- down everybody wants to be in the carolinas so in case you guys don't know he's got a great podcast it's called the gold collar investor but you know before we dive into the missteps man tell the listeners how they can get in contact with you absolutely so like you said i have a podcast the gold collar investor my email is p at the gold collar investor.com I also, uh, they can reach out to me there on LinkedIn or Facebook, and I also provide uh, six, top six reasons to diversify outside of Wall Street investments. If you're there interested, they can get it on my website at thegoldcollarinvestor.com forward slash download. Ooh, full, six reasons why you should invest outside of Wall Street, ladies and gentlemen. You got to get that. I don't have it yet. I'm going to get it right now. So while he's doing that, well, while I'm doing that, I need you to give the listeners a little bit about your background, kind of formal introduction and kind of where you are today in your multifamily journey. Sure. Um, So I came to this country in 2003 to get my master's. And after I graduated in 2005, the idea was that I'll work here for a few years and go back to India for good and start something on my own. And 2009 and 10, we found out that we were expecting a baby and we said, you know what, let's stay here for some time. It's hard uh, to move countries during this time. So we, you know, delayed our plans and 2011, we decided to be staying here for good. And that's when I started investing here from single family homes to duplexes, triplexes, expanded into five states, slowly decided that, you know, this is, it was slow and it was great. And I, I love this world of investing and decided that I want to, do this as a full-time thing and wanted to scale, got into multifamily and syndications. And, you know, two, two years ago, almost two years ago, I quit my job to do this full-time. And since then it's been a blast. So, Oh my goodness. You quit your job to do this full-time ladies and gentlemen. All right. So that's what were you doing before? Cause usually uh, people who are high income earners are trapped in the golden handcuffs. So what were you doing before you? So I had the, the golden handcuffs like this thick on both of my hands. They were so bad. Like it, it was hard because I was making a really good salary in New York City. I was uh, in fintech industry, uh, you know, in derivatives and finance here in New York and uh, computer science background and finance, um, you know, as a minor. So I was make you know, I was doing that and I was doing all this investing on the side. But like you said, the golden handcuffs were really strong. So I I had to get out of them. Uh, and it was an easy process. And I can get into that if you want. But basically, uh, I was an engineer, I was making very good salary, but it wasn't fulfilling enough. And, uh, you know, even though I liked my job, uh, the company I worked with, uh, the people I worked with, so, but, you know, this thing, the investing side, um, you know, when I read Cash Flow Quadrant from Rich Dad Poor Dad, and the, from Robert Kiyosaki, you know, that he talks about this quadrant, E, S, 
B and I, right? Employees, self-employed on the left and business owners and investors on the right. So, you know, 90% of the wealth in the world is controlled by people on the right and at 10% on the left, but people on the left work 90% of like, 90% of their uh, times, you know, they, they spend on this stuff. So I decided I want to move to the right and investing was uh, the thing to go. And I also love this stuff, uh, investing in, um, you know, uh, real estate so much that I was spending way too much time on this stuff anyway. And yeah, so you know what decided to let go of my golden handcuffs wasn't easy, but I did it and I'm happy that I did it. Outstanding. And so I think it's important for listeners, the, the B in the I quadrant, business owner and investor. And I think a lot of people confuse what an investor is versus a business owner. A lot of times when you're active in real estate, people say, I, I am a real estate investor, but you're usually a real estate business owner. Do you have any thoughts on the BNI and how the real estate um, investor actually fits into that? Absolutely. Actually, that's a great question. And, you know, I've spent a lot of time on that particular topic myself, actually. So the business owner generally, as per Robert Kiyosaki's definition, is really people where, uh, you know, people who have a companies where their number of employees are more than 500. Okay, so so that's a definition as per Robert Kiyosaki. But if you really uh, look at real estate investors, you know, when you're investing passively or even actively, let's say you buy a house and you rent it out to tenants and you're getting some cash flow every month, you're active in that business, meaning that you're, uh, yeah, your income is passive, but whenever there's a problem, you are going, you're getting, you're the one who's getting the phone call. And similarly, if you're investing passively, uh, that is purely passive stuff. But when it comes to me, like, or people like you, uh, Jerome or me, uh, where we have Cindy, your syndicators, in that case, there's a line between passive investments and the business. So syndication is a business, right? But what we do with our money, when we invest in our own deals or someone else's deals, that is investing. So there is a difference between uh, syndication, which is a business. And when we actually buy a property and invest our own money, that is the investment. So uh, you can think of our company as a small business owner, but what we do with our money is invest, right? Love it. That's, Love it. that's how I would define it. Perfect. Now, in all of this real estate investing and leaving the job behind and all that, everything went exactly as you planned, right? <laughs> I wish Jerome that it happened. It's it's a straight line, you know, like just like that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Sequentially, boom, 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 boom. Yeah, exactly. At the time for the exact amount of money you thought, all of the things, right? Exactly. You know, like in in uh, computer science, we have a Jira board. Like it's a software where we put plan scrums and stuff. So we put like all the items that we need to do. So the things exactly hit the timelines, you know, like, oh, you want to do this? It was perfect. No, you know, you and I know that that is far from the truth. The things are like, it's jig, 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 yeah, it's a big uh, zigzag, zigzag uh, when it comes to, you know, owning a business or investing uh, and especially in this market cycle. So no, it's not been a straight line. It's not even a zigzag. It's been, I don't even know, like a circle, this, that, you know, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so it's not a straight line. Got it. So I know you said that pre, pre-recording, you know, find fun, fix, flip. You didn't have much for flipping. You didn't have much for funding, but you might have something for finding and you might have something for fixing. So I don't know where you want to go first, but I would love to go with finding because I think everybody has some type of war story from finding deals or messing up in the process of getting them to the point where you're on the contract. Sure. So for finding, there are a couple of things that I can talk about. Like first, like when we initially got into multifamily, we decided we want to do multifamily. At that time, I had already invested in five states. 
in smaller properties. So I had broker relationships, even though they were for single family homes and smaller properties. I told all those brokers that I'm getting into multifamily, you know, send me 12 units, 24 units, up to 50 units. I would love to, you know, look at those deals and do some of them. So as you know, time went on, they sent, start sending the deals. I started flying to these places, Ohio, Pennsylvania, you know, Georgia, and uh, looking at these deals. And suddenly, uh, you know, we started finding deals that we liked and they were trading at, let's say, a 12 cap. And uh, we would be like, oh, you know what? This should be 13 cap. No, you know, it should, it's, it's, it, this guy's asking for too much. Um, and the market has been going up and up. So, you know, we would look at these deals and for one reason or the another, we would not go under the contract because we felt the price was way too much. And in some cases, we would go under the contract and we would get out because we would, you know, talk ourselves out of the contract because of, you know, some DD, like due diligence items that came in that we didn't expect. Uh, even though we could have easily absorbed it. So so what happened was like mindset wise, we were under, like we looked at a 12 unit that we were so close to get under contract then 24 unit. And, uh, you know, there was a 78 unit deal. There's a good story about that deal. I can talk about that. But so there were many of these deals where we were always, you know, very close to the finish line, but we couldn't really get it uh, to the closing table. And, we, me and my partner, we started discussing like, why is this happening, right? We are engineers by background and, you know, believe it or not, like we understand analysis paralysis, but that is real, right? And so we, we were, you know, from mindset wise, we, we were always behind the market, even though at a 12 cap, that might, may have been a great deal, but we were always thinking, you know what? No, 13 cap is the way to go. Like I, we don't think that uh, we don't want to overpay in this market. The market had moved by that time. So we made a decision that we want to hire a coach. We really need a help, uh, need help to, uh, you know, someone to oversee our shoulder, like, you know, uh, oversee some of the things that we are doing and help us out that what we are doing wrong. So we did get uh, coaching and we did close deals after that. But let me talk about that 78 unit story that I was talking about. So there was this deal, 78 units in Columbia, South Carolina. We were, uh, we went under contract. There was uh, Columbia Housing Authority actually owned the deal. It was not an on-market deal. This came through the same broker who I used to buy some smaller homes. And uh, so when th this deal came to us, we liked the deal. We looked at it and we went under contract. And when we were doing due diligence, we found so many things on the property where things didn't go as expected one of the townhome units we went in, uh, we were told that all the units are occupied. We went into that unit, there were no stairs to go up. And <laughs> the, the stairs were missing. So you can imagine this uh, situation in that unit. And the other unit, there were no walls. There were only studs and it was fully gutted and no stairs to go up. And so, you know, and there were a bunch of other things that came in. And one of the buildings had a very clear, visible crack near foundation. And it felt like it shifted uh, a little bit, which might have been uh, okay, but we didn't even get to the structural engineer. Uh, so we we felt that, you know what, this these guys uh, didn't uh, tell us exactly what the condition of the property was when we went in a contract. So we don't know what we'll find. Again, it was our first deal. Uh, we, we said, no, we lost about $15,000 in that deal, but that was the best 15,000 that we lost. What was uh, the 15 on? Was it on the due dil like the due diligence? We had a full contract. Yeah. So we paid the contractor. We had already engaged the attorney who prepared a contract. We had, you know, plumbing company coming in to, sewer, uh, to camera the sewer lines. We had the um, roofing company come in. Uh, and then uh, there was uh, one more thing. So the, all in all, we had about $15,000 um, total that went um, 
you know down oh yeah assistant attorney we had engaged that to like so so it was like um, you know best 15000 we lost but did you lose your due diligence money too or was it just the no the, the honest his... money you mean the emd that yeah. we put no no we didn't lose that 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 okay we got that <laughs> back no no we didn't put money hard uh, so early in our game so no yeah we so that's one deal that i think i would call uh, lessons learned but we were happy that we didn't do it but for the all the other deals that we left if we would have done every single one of them there would have been great i'll tell you like there there was this deal in ohio a school district which was 10 out of 10 amazing location and the broker himself i think lived there or someone from his family lived there uh excellent excellent location it was a 12 unit and the next door 12 units were also we could have easily gotten and and maintained by a owner i think who owned it for 30 years really really good condition and we left it because the roof was in in great condition and and i think that was the reason and and we were we just felt uh, you know we all we would find all the reasons that why we shouldn't do the deal we still think of it that this way but you know i think but that deal if we would have done today i we would have um you know we would have done well a lot of people want to be profitable multifamily operators but lack the knowledge deal flow experience and capital to be successful they often try to overcome these challenges out of order slowing or eliminating their ability to get their next deal done we've developed a framework that allows them to gain the knowledge they need to find profitable deals when they do they create the time and location freedom as well as the generational wealth they desire for their family The Myers methods of multifamily investing have proved to be the fastest way to establish credibility and properly grow an apartment portfolio. If you want to know more about our four-step process, jump over to myersmethods.com to get our free four-step guide to getting into multifamily investing. Let's get back to that. I mean, it's always interesting when I hear people say that because I think your gut tells you, "Hey, there's an issue here." with the ish did you try to negotiate with the seller and they went and adjust on price or like what happened on the roof in particular yeah same thing they didn't ag- agree or a- adjust on the price and it was a flat roof we 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 were little uh we had not done anything with flat roofs till the point and we were a little uh you know um uh, hesitant because when we found that the roof because our roofer went up and he said the flat roof is very soft and the water there's water below that so he thinks the water has gone through the you know into the attic space so he has to go and look at it and um, you know so when we told that to the seller seller flipped he's like you know he i owned this for 30 years and he had bunch of patches on the roof and uh he said there's no issue and we were like you know why is he not letting us go in and it was just uh uh we just let it go man that sounds like a can of worms i i, I don't know if i would have taken it down without unless you wrote your contract in a place where you knew that you were buying it well enough in order to handle the unexpected on the back side of that but yeah. i mean It's no. really difficult to take care of that type of expense because you can't raise the rents because you fixed the roof. It's not going to work. Yeah, exactly. That's one of the things. But what I'm trying to say is that for that deal, just because he said no, he's not going to negotiate. We could have tried to factor in the price of what would it take to replace the roof, and also what would it take to fix everything inside, and put that in our capex budget, and then still do the deal. um because it was an amazing uh, location uh, generally speaking and we are talk- i'm talking 2014 or 15 here um which was still a very very good time uh, to get into some of the stuff so we could get some deals and so you think you could have recouped it through raising rents and improving operations you yeah did the rents have you checked recently have the rents gone up more than what you thought they would have for your pro forma because it's always great when you put the pro forma together and 
yeah it, it, the numbers are there but that doesn't mean anything <laughs> yeah so i'll tell you that uh i didn't check recently but about two and a half years ago when i checked they that particular property is probably two and a half to three times in price i know that but i don't know the rents i didn't check the rents okay so did they sell it to somebody else and they decided to take on the roof and all the other challenges? Because what I always yeah. do if I lose a deal is I, I check the price and see what the other person bought it at. You know, so someone bought it at even higher than what we paid, uh, what we agreed to pay. Really? Okay. Yeah, but that was, again, 2015. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you were looking for a 12 cap, though. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And so yeah. that was... Was that the South Carolina deal or another deal? Uh, that was a different one. That was a 12 okay. unit in, in um, uh, one part of uh, Cleveland, if I don't know, Cleveland or Columbus, Ohio. Those yeah. markets are funny, man. It's interesting you said that the prices have doubled because what I see a lot of times there is just, you know, they cash flow well, but they don't appreciate it. Yeah, no, they, they, they don't. But I'm talking about an area which is a very... Uh, high demand area like you know school rating 10 out of 10 people want to live there houses are much much higher prices and all that so i've never seen a school rating 10 out of 10 i thought six out of 10 was the most they could <laughs> okay all right so that was the finding it part so you relax your expectations with coming into the properties it sounds yeah. like i wouldn't say we relaxed let's say we got in tune with the market okay and so does getting in tune with the market mean you change your offer on the go in or you're willing to pay more or you expect willing to less pay more returns willing to pay willing more. to pay more because we are expecting less in return Okay. And so for the folks, cause you syndicate for the folks who you talked to prior to doing the deals, I imagine you're probably telling them 15 or 20% uh, cash on cash. And you come back and you probably telling them less than 10% now. How did that go? Over? So, yeah, exactly. That's a good uh, question. So not on cash and cash on IRR. We do, we used to do like uh, we used to say like 17, 18, 19 IRR. So for last three years, we've gone to 15 IRR. Then we went to 14 IRR. Now we are around 13, 12, 13, like, you know, 12, 13, 14 range uh, in terms of IRR. So that's what we have been telling investors. And um, on cash on cash, we used to give out eight pref. We went down to seven pref uh on the cash on cash returns so yeah well we told our investors this is exactly you know the prices are going up and these are the you know this is what market has been accepting as returns and you know this is and our investors have been pretty it was received pretty well and they, they were okay with that did you relax your asset management fee or acquisition fee or any of the comp for yourself too no so what on the acquisition fee and on the the asset so nothing on a acquisition fee but on asset management fee what we have been telling our investors is that we don't take that fee if you don't meet the pref right so oh wow wow yeah wow you can end up working for free like that that's scary for me yeah, it is. It is scary. But, you know, like uh, I, I actually think the fee should go up for acquisition because we're putting in so much time. Uh, it's just uh, the reverse, actually, just because we're putting in so much time that we're spinning our wheels and just to get one opportunity in, fr in front of the investors. But from the asset management point of view, that's what we have been doing. Should we do that? I don't know. I just feel that's right way to do it yeah. and we can get it yeah. i get it i mean you you want to treat the investors well and i mean early in the career i think you have to do some of that just to get them to stay in the game with you and 
because nobody enjoys when they have a financial advisor and they get paid whether the market goes up or down, right? Exactly. And that's what happens a ton of time. And I mean, the property managers, they get paid no matter what, you know, if, if you have exactly. enough money to pay your expenses that much that month, good for you. If you don't, I'm still getting paid. And, you know, a lot of asset managers and syndicators feel the same way. And I don't know what the right answer is because I think investors and partners should want the people who are spending their time on a thing to get paid so that they continue to pay attention to it because the flip side of that thing is true as well. If the person doesn't get paid, they're probably at some point going to have to go find a way to earn income and they're mm -hmm. not going to be paying attention to the asset. Yep, exactly. Okay. And so let's move to a deal that you were operating and it sounds like you, you had some learning lessons there that the listeners can take away. Always raise more than what you think it's going to cost. So <laughs> no, it costs less than what you budgeted and it always happens faster than you expect, right? <laughs> exactly. It's always the other way. So we had a deal actually in Charlotte where uh, when going in, we knew there was some structural issue with the deal, one of the buildings. And um, we budgeted about $50,000 to fix that. We got a rough estimate at the time of inspections. And when we actually did it, it cost, we spent 102.5. So it was little over the double the amount. Whoa. Whoa. That happened yeah. to me. <laughs> What's that? It happened oh, to in you. My first deal. Oh, yeah. It happened to me on my first deal. I don't know that it was double, but I, I totally blew the construction budget. And if I was doing the deal by myself, I would have been bankrupt because... We were spending a lot of money in construction. <laughs> yeah, no. So we we learned that the hard way. We, luckily, we had enough capital raised overall that we were able to, you know, go through that. But then our other things got cut that we wanted to do. So, you know what? But but we 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 came out good, and those things were nice to have. The ones we cut, this was must have. So. We went with the must have and, and did it. Without question. That's, that's when it gets scary. You start seeing that reserve account go down and oh. go down and your income is going down and your expenses are staying steady or going up depending on what you have going on. And you get the temptation to just bury your operational costs and the capital costs. Yeah. All I'll tell you stuff. one thing, like people don't budget uh, uh, that, you know, we have learned the hard way. So when things are going good, Every, like income, like you said, and the expenses, they're all in line, right? And you're making your, uh, meeting your budget. But when the income starts going down, right? Actually, expenses usually will go up. <laughs> now, you're like, why? The reason is because you're spending more. Because there is a reason why the income has gone down. Whatever the reason is. COVID or... You know what, you know, the units are down or there's some, uh, you know, unit burned down or whatever it is, right? The, your income going down is a function of a problem and you have to fix that problem, which wasn't there before. So leaving everything else the same, to fix that problem, you have to spend more. And that's when your expenses go up. So your bottom line gets hurt by from two places, the top line and the bottom, like the, 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 the expense line. Double whammy. Don't tell them that though. Right. <laughs> and the other thing I'd love to see is when people do their pro formas and they put 98% occupancy and they're doing a rehab project. Yeah, that, that, um, you know, that can only happen if they're doing everything only on turns. Like, I don't know what the, what, what do you mean by rehab? If they're just turning the units and making them really nice from inside, if that's what you're talking about, then yeah, that can still be done. But if you're talking about like some major item, then no, you, you have to have the building, uh, empty. Yeah, there, there's always some change. And so when I say rehab, just really upfitting, right? It doesn't have to be massive, but 
I think it takes a little bit of time to change paint color. Say you've got a building, your trim's one color or your trim's, your trim and your walls are the same color. That's what I like to walk into. Trim, walls, and ceiling are all painted the same color. I've even seen places where they painted the appliances with wall paint, right? <laughs> and so you come in and you know that you've got to repaint the whole thing. You got to do flooring, you got to do lights. Like that takes a little bit of time depending on who's actually handling the construction. And that will probably extend to the term where you're just wiping the walls off and moving the next person in after you know, it's been swept out. Very different timelines for getting those things available. And then also market it at that new rate. Sometimes when you go to market and you've increased rent, let's call it a hundred bucks, the market kind of looks at you like, what are you doing? And then eventually they, they take it, but it takes a little bit of long and a little bit longer in the marketing cycle. So that's what I'm saying. Um, oh, and you need something to tour, right? Because- yeah. You, you got the unit and you can't walk them through it because it's not going to look like that when you lease it to them. So it, there's the other piece of you got to have a vacant so people can see what the unit's going to look like. Right. Exactly. But, okay. Man, this has been an outstanding episode. Do you have any more war stories you want to share with the listeners today? No, I think, uh, you know, I, I have a few others, but they're, they're still work in progress. Maybe next time once they're done. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. And so I guess what words of wisdom do you have for the listeners as a wrap up? No, I would say that, you know, be a student uh, of uh, whatever you're trying to achieve and, and keep learning and take action at the same time. Right. And you don't get to see everything, you know, very clearly from the first uh, it's possible that you may not see everything clearly, uh, but you can take some action and go a little further and see a little bit more and take further action and keep doing that. And you will, you will, uh, you know, uh, overall succeed in whatever you're trying to do. Man, that's outstanding, Pancham. Thank you so much for coming on Multifamily Missteps. And to the listeners, the pack is with you. We'll see you the next time. It's a favor. Give us a five-star rating. Give us a review and share this with somebody who's interested in multifamily investing. Until the next time, the pack is with you.